situation. It is one of the positives, I guess, which has come out of a terrible world we're living in with the pandemic, that uh, we can meet over Zoom in ways that might not have been possible if we were still living in the real uh, world. So as you all know, and please feel free uh, you know, to interrupt me with comments or questions as I go along, but as you all know, Hank Snaefley was clearly a quite remarkable man who was dedicated to the vision of a global revolution that would liberate the oppressed from their chains that bound them, whether that was in the West or in the colonial or semi-colonial developing countries. He was firm in his beliefs, something which did not always endear him to everyone who he interacted with throughout his life. But I think a question arose of whether his globalist perspective survived in a world that was increasingly focused on the nation state and the promotion of the national interest. So while that vision uh, for the early Communist Party may have failed, there's no doubt that his impact on the early communist movement uh, in China left at least two important legacies that have uh, reverberated down to the present. The first was that there was a need for a disciplined political organization that was backed up by strong propaganda apparatus. And secondly, which is one of the things I'll dwell on in these comments, was um, the strategy of the United Front to form alliances to pursue their political objectives. Now, in the pre-COVID era, it took barely 11 hours to fly from Amsterdam to Shanghai. So I think it's very hard for us to conceive of the journey the Snafi had to undertake to get from Moscow via Holland to arrive in Shanghai. It certainly wasn't an easy journey. He left Berlin on the 8th of April, 1921. Uh, he caught the night train. He stopped in Vienna to try and get his visa to China only to be arrested by the Austrian police at that time. Despite that, he still managed to get a boat uh, on the 18th of April from Venice that was bound for China. The problem it set for him though, was that the authorities were now alerted to his travels and the British colonial forces banned him entry to any port along the way. It also meant that uh, in Shanghai, the authorities had also been alerted to his pending arrival. And as a result, the, the Dutch Consul General had uh, said that immediately upon arrival, he had to register with the authorities. Arriving on the 3rd of June, he duly registered on June 4th. So the Shanghai in which he arrived was a bustling, as a cosmopolitan city, and it was a home to a nascent labor movement. And of course, the international ambiance meant that not only people, but also ideas flowed quite freely. Also importantly, the foreign concessions within Shanghai meant that activists could meet and conspire out of the reach of the Chinese authorities. And more broadly, the China that uh, Snaefried entered in 1921 was one in flux. The dynastic system had already collapsed in 1911, a system which had operated in different guises over a few thousand years. And it had been replaced by a hodgepodge of warlords and essentially their power only reached as far as their military might would actually carry them. But for the young activists, and this was the group that uh, Snaefleet interacted with most with, it was actually a frustrating, of course, but I think also an exhilarating uh, time as they explored, explored together different thought systems that they thought might restore order uh, to the nation. Anarchism was very popular. And initially anarchism was more popular than Marxism uh, or variants of social democracy and so forth. Republicanism, uh, militarism, and more. And just showing the fl fluidity of the 13 Chinese who participated in that first party Congress, only two of them stuck with it through to 1949. One of those of course being Mao Zedong himself. But what was important was the 1917 a Russian Revolution. And that seemed to offer a path to redemption from the humiliation that was experienced at the hands of the Western powers and the chance to rebuild an economy which is devastated by internal revolt and foreign incursions. Now, the victorious Bolsheviks, they had no hesitation 
in exporting their revolution beyond their borders. And China was really seen as a key country in the start struggle between the old world and what they saw as the bold and the new world moving forward. So Snaefleet arrived then in Shanghai just in time for the First Party Congress. And as I mentioned, those foreign concessions meant the activists could meet and conspire out of the reach of the colonial, or sorry, of the Chinese authorities. So where they actually met was in the French concession. It brought together 13 Chinese members. It brought together a Dutchman. It brought together a Russian together to plot the future. And those participants met clandestinely in the home of one of the participants, huddled around a table, debating vigorously their different visions of a future for China. And the Chinese participants, including Mao Zedong, as I said, were very disillusioned with what they saw as their political inheritance. And they were drawn from an assortment of radical study groups that had evolved across the country, primarily after uh, the collapse of the dynastic uh, rule in 1911. Some of those formed independently, but some of them did form with Soviet promptings and support. But it was a very precarious nature. And the precarious nature was shown pretty quickly when the proceedings uh, in the house was interrupted by an intruder who clearly must have been a police agent. He entered the house and then he started to mutter excuses about having interrupted. So they swiftly abandoned the meeting and they adjourned uh, to meet again in a lake uh, in a neighboring province. Now, of course, uh, for a Russian and a Dutchman to have gone along with them would only have attracted too much attention. So neither Snaefleet nor um, uh, Nikolsky attended that meeting on the lake where they thrashed out their political program. So Snaefleet, I think, must have appeared as an imposing figure to the young men who gathered together for the Congress. I mean, first of all, remember, he came with the imprimatur of Lenin and the Comintern to come uh, to Shanghai to work uh, with them. Perhaps even more importantly, he had a revolutionary experience that those who were present at that meeting lacked. He had the engagement previously with the Dutch labor movement, and also, of course, the work in the anti-colonial uh, movement in the Dutch East Indies, Indies uh, working with uh, the nationalist movement of the Sarkat Islam. And those experiences were extremely important in shaping his approach to the strategy and the tactics that he suggested to push forward the revolution in China. As I mentioned, he proposed and had accepted uh, two key uh, ideas, one about the, nation, the nature of a Leninist uh, disciplined party, but secondly, um, the idea that it was impossible for the communists to promote that revolution in isolation, and it would be essential to ally with a broader nationalist movement that was already stirring in China. So following the fall of the Qing dynasty in 1911, Sun Yat-sen, who was seen as the father of the nationalist movement, had set about building a force to unify China. And he had very strong support from the Chinese overseas, and he formed the Nationalist Party, the Guomindang, or KMT, as it's often referred to. And that was the party that Snaefleet would push the communists to join. He proposed that the alliance would take the form of communists joining the nationalists as individuals. Uh, in what he termed a united front. Now, while Snaefleet got acceptance of those two concept, uh, concepts, despite his very best efforts, the comrades in Moscow and in China never really fully accepted his approach to that united front of working within uh, the nationalist uh, movement as individuals. And in some ways, like so many other foreigners, he left China disillusioned, wondering why they could not be more like us. It was a really tough job, you know, to try and understand the reality on the ground in China, made of course much more difficult through his lack of the Chinese language and his lack of familiarity with Chinese culture. But it wasn't only that, he had to render any reporting he made in a way that was consistent with strategies and ideological dictates that were emanating from Moscow. 
And further, he had to persuade the comrades in China to accept the strategies and tactics that derived from that. In some ways, Snaefield was almost like a spider at the center of a web, much of which was not of his own weaving and his own making. And the problems he was going to have were already apparent at that first party congress in Shanghai in July 1921. It was a lively affair by the accounts we have and a relatively unstructured affair. But the debates exposed divisions on crucial questions about who should be a member, how should the 50 plus members work with the labor movement, and should communists join the national parliament, which actually had been established in Beijing as the national government. And Snaefly was not happy with the debates that he observed. He felt that they reflected the bookish, small study group origins of the communist cells. And the proponents rejected labor, uh, or sorry, the, the majority of the uh, participants at the Congress actually rejected labor activism as a priority. In fact, as far as they were concerned, the workers had little understanding of Marxism. And as a result, members should actually take time to undertake education and carry out propaganda as their main source of activities. Perhaps they even argued Bolshevism was not the most appropriate form of socialism for the party, and it should ne necessarily adopt it. Uh, maybe it would be beneficial to study, for example, other approaches, such as German social democracy. And then after that study, decide what's going to be best for China's future and its needs. Yes, some type of organization was necessary, but not necessarily a Bolshevik style, tightly organized working class party that was destined to usher in the dictatorship of the proletariat. Not surprisingly, given those predilections, uh, they didn't see any problem with collaborating with Sun Yat-sen's nationalists in the South. Sorry, that was the minority view, I should have said. The majority though, actually rejected that approach. And they argued that the immediate priority was for the establishment of the dictatorship of the proletariat. Exactly how, with only 53 Communist Party members, they were going to achieve that was never actually clearly articulated. Intellectuals were not welcome in the party, they said. Somewhat bizarre, given the background of university students that uh, all these uh, early founders uh, comprised of, and there was to be no collaboration with bourgeois nationalists. And the documents they adopted at that Congress reflected that isolationist stance. Capitalists were to be overthrown by the revolutionary army of the proletariat. Classes would be abolished and other parties were to be met with independence, aggression and exclusion. So Snaefly clearly wasn't very impressed uh, with the quality of the debates, and he developed and retained, I would say, an ambivalence about the party and its role. In fact, just before that first party Congress, he wrote that not too much money should be spent in China, and that perhaps in a year, a more truly well-organized party might be formed. And that negative attitude never really went away. So for example, in July, 1922, when he was presenting to the Comintern in Moscow, he told them that, yeah, a propaganda group might've been much better. And right up until he left China in 1923, he retained the preference uh, for the Communist Party for propaganda, for education work and activism within the emerging labor movement. Those activities, he wrote, were more important than establishing a political party and he complained about the continual infighting, which was undermining uh, unity. And in June 1923, he made the withering comment that the fact that it, meaning the party, was born much too early in 1920, or better said, fabricated, still weighs heavily on the party. Not only was the birth premature, but it was supported too strongly by foreign means. So far from delighting in that lively debate, he saw the party's independent spirit as a sign of naivete. What really transformed his uh, view and his perception 
about what would be possible with the revolution was his travels after that Congress to the south of China. And there he thought he saw the potential for his approach uh, being realized. So he saw the nationalists, the Kuomintang, as the best partner, partner for collaboration because he witnessed the huge seamen strike that had gripped the South during the winter of 1921-1922. That strike impressed uh, Snavely. He wrote, it was undoubtedly the most important event in the history of the young Chinese labor movement. And the strike culminated in victory in March 1922, when the authorities caved, they agreed to wage increases of between 15 and 30 percent and another, a number of other beneficial uh, actions. Now, Snavely thought the leadership of that strike lay clearly with the Nationalist Party. But in fact, the two key leaders were neither members of the Nationalist Party nor of the Communist uh, Party. It's true that there were links uh, between the Guomindang and the strike. In fact, Sun Yat-sen had written the calligraphy uh, for the signboard uh, for the strikers' organizations. But I think while those actions were um, impressive, I think Snaefley was somewhat misled about the role of the nationalists because he arrived at the height of the strike and his main interlocutor was a member of the Nationalist Party. And that encouraged him, I think, to see great possibilities for long-term cooperation. So now he was faced with three challenges after going to the South. The first was, of course, he had to persuade Sun Yat-sen and the nationalists uh, that it was important to work together. Second, he had to get those in Moscow on board with that idea. And thirdly, he had to sell the approach to the Chinese com uh, comrades. And achieving all of those three objectives was not easy. First of all, with respect to Sun Yat-sen and the nationalists, he was ambivalent about Sun Yat-sen, particularly his leadership style, but he did defend him as the most viable nationalist from Moscow and the Chinese Communist Party to work with. But what was it that concerned him? Well, for Snaefly, for a party that was supposedly committed to democracy, he saw Sun Yat-sen as more inclined towards a dictatorial style with a mil militaristic bent in his activities. Snaefly wanted the nationalists to be or reorganized along Leninist lines. He thought of that nationalist movement or that party as a broad tent that could attract into it students, workers, and peasants. He felt that if propaganda work was strengthened, that would ensure that Sun Yat-sen did not have to rely on the support of a few generals to survive. In fact, Snaefly, in some of his writings, was baffled by Sun Yat-sen's understanding of Marxism and his belief in traditional Chinese thought. Sun Yat-sen expressed that he was puzzled why so many young people were attracted to Marxism, as all the basic ideas of Marxism were to be found in the Chinese classics. So for Sun, he said that, well, Marxism proposes nothing new, as it had all been said 2,000 years ago in those Chinese classics. Somewhat typical Chinese view, I would say. Secondly, though, there was the question of what to do about Moscow. And initially, he was able to bring the Comintern leadership on board with his views. But even here, opposition developed over time. And that came as different uh, groups in China began to establish contacts in Moscow and feed information uh, back to Moscow, which was sometimes critical, often critical in fact, and posed different ideas about strategy for what should be done in China. So Snavely then found himself between also the different priorities of the Comintern and also Narcomindel, which is basically the Russian Foreign Affairs Ministry. Whereas in China, he had an authority just by his experience, and that would allow him in a way to pull rank and talk about organizational discipline to get compliance. Moscow was a much tougher arena. He couldn't appeal to a higher understanding of Leninism to get his views accepted, nor could he appeal to organizational discipline in Moscow. 
Yet in the initial visit in July 1922, those differences were not apparent. The starting point for his analysis was that the absence of a modern working class, an undifferentiated peasantry, and an ineffective Communist Party organization had made him very pessimistic about the movement in China and its possibilities. The Communist Party, in his view, had no independent base, and that confirmed the necessity of working with the nationalists. As I said, despite his reservations about Sun Yat-sen and his leadership style, what Snaefli did devise was the novel idea that actually the Guomindang was not a bourgeois party based on a single class, but really it was an amalgam of four different groups. First, there was the leading intelligentsia, many of whom were attracted to socialism. Second, were the emigrants living in other colonial countries, and he saw those as the motive force in the Chinese nationalist movement, and they were more important in his view to the revolution than the Chinese capitalists, who were much more or much too closely tied uh, to uh, the foreign powers in terms of their interests. The emigrants provided Sun Yat-sen with crucial financial support, and they did expect China's reunification that would end warlord rule and foreign exploitation. Third, there were the soldiers of the Southern government. And finally, last but not least, there were the workers. And he felt that that flexible structure would allow the Chinese Communist Party to operate within the nationalists. And then the role of the Chinese communists was to keep the alliance together and push the movement to the left. That argumentation initially proved convincing to the Comintern leadership. The third challenge, though, uh, was bringing the CCP leaders in line and keeping them in line. And that proved extremely difficult. Their concerns and opposition began to find their way back to the Comintern leadership, leaders such as Radek, uh, Safarov, and Wojtynski, who had preceded Snaefli in China. And they became critical of China's role. Already in April 1922, which was when Snaefli went back to Shanghai from having been in the South, key leaders such as Chen Duxiu, uh, the leader of the Chinese Communist Movement, rejected his view. And they wrote to Wojtynski to complain about this approach. Now, the objections were not entirely unreasonable. So for example, outside of the South, the Nationalist Party was not especially strong. So their argument was, well, so why should the Communist Party develop the Nationalist Party's strength as opposed to concentrating on its own forces? But the main issue of contention, and this was the one that uh, went throughout the time that he was there, was how that engagement should be carried out. Snaefleet, as I said, had proposed that all Chinese Communist Party members join the Nationalists as individuals in a united front. Others accepted, yeah, we have to work with them, but they wanted to work alongside the Guomindang as uh, two collaborating, but still independent organizations. Now in August, 1922, this is when Snaefli came back again from Moscow, he brought an important instruction from Moscow, which essentially endorsed uh, his views. Um, that a propaganda organization would be established to carry out work independently, but for the most part, the communists should be working through the Nationalist Party itself. And he used that support from Moscow to bring the Chinese comrades in line. Again, it was not easy. And there is a debate about to what extent he invoked uh, Comintern discipline to gain support. Many of the Chinese uh, accounts talk about him pushing this on them, claiming common turn authority, Snaefleet himself on a number of occasions said, no, I didn't force them. I didn't use common turn discipline for this. For Chun Du Xiu, the leader of the party, and Zhang Guotao, an early leader of the Communist Party and a late arrival uh, to uh, Mao Zedong, in their view, no matter how you defined it, the Guomindang, the Nationalist Party, was still a bourgeois party. 
and they were concern concerned that a close alliance would constrain CCP independence. Yes, cooperation was important, but as I said before, what they called a block without. And Chen Duxiu's acquiescence uh, to Snaefleet's view was conditional, and he would only support the tactic if Sun Yat-sen revoked the ruling that required new party members to pledge personal allegiance to him, and also not to have to place their fingerprint on that oath of allegiance. Well, so despite different concerns, uh, that meeting was crucial in August 22, because it took that historic decision for individuals to join the nationalists while retaining their CCP membership. Everything seemed to be falling in place, but it was really just at that moment that concern in Moscow increased about what they see, saw as Snaefleet's too close relationship with the Guomindang, and the views diverged over whether the priority was to build a mass political party or to develop the United Front. Now, Snaefleet went back again in late December 1922 to Moscow, and he was very surprised to discover uh, that he needed to de again defend that tactic of uh, cooperation. Is in various letters that he wrote to his colleague von Rabastein, uh, he talks about these challenges and problems. So three main topics were discussed. The first concerned the question of, is Sun Yat-sen the correct nationalist to support? Some actually had been drawn to the Northern Lord Lord, Wu Pei Fu, who controlled Beijing and the surrounding area. And some claimed that he was sympathetic to the actions of the communists. However, in February 1923, any sympathy uh, should have been blown away by his slaughter of the striking railway workers in the North who were demanding the recognition uh, for their union. And effectively it destroyed Communist Party labor activism in the North. Second, there were concerns that Snaefly had ignored common turn work for that of Russian foreign affairs, working much too closely with Adolf Joffa who had been sent to China on behalf of the foreign ministry. And I think this reflected emerging tensions um, in Moscow between pursuing the Russian national interest and maintaining the ethos of an international revolutionary uh, movement. Certainly Joffa and Snaefli had become very concerned about how Soviet policy was being viewed in China. Particularly, uh, there was a, a very key arterial railway, the China Eastern Railway, uh, which Russia had initially said they would give back to China, not wanting any compensation. And that now seemed to be debatable whether they would do that or not. And then secondly, what to do uh, with Mongolia became a problem. And they were claiming that on, in those two instances, Russia was being seen as little different uh, from behaving like other colonial powers. Now for the two of them in a country such as China, they felt the pure common turn work was impossible. There had to be conditional support for promoting national liberation. What they said in the document they wrote was that Russian policy had to be nation friendly and anti-imperialistic. The third uh, question which arose on this return back to Moscow was that the executive committee of the Communist International uh, sessions were dominated by discussions on the tactic of cooperation with the, with the nationalists, the role of the labor movement, and whether a mass party uh, could be uh, developed. Snaefeli was very critical uh, of the view about developing a mass communist party. He wrote scornfully about the idea of just 250 communists creating a mass party capable of independent political activity. He said if they went down that route, the Communist Party would just become a meaningless sect as a result. He said there was a delusion that a policy of independent nationalists, uh, sorry, policy independent of the nationalists could be developed. So he defended that approach. Uh, and it seemed, however, that the ground was shifting to a view that not only should the Communist Party have its own separate organization, but that should be the focus of the work. 
Now, even after the crushing of the railway workers' strike in February 1923, Wojtynski did not abandon uh, his view, and he argued that further strike action in northern China was possible, and that the Kuomintang had shown its weakness during the strike by not mobilizing support, and that Sun Yat-sen had not focused enough on building the party and continuing to behave as if his party was just a warlord faction. So he saw an alternative path being explored in Moscow, and his tentacles reached out to influence some Communist Party members in China with this idea that a mass Communist Party could become a reality. To wrap up then, these things came to a head at the Third Party Congress held in Guangzhou, uh, Canton, in June 1923. For some in the Communist Party, including leader Chen Duxiu, that defeat of the February strike had a really sobering impact on their thinking. Their faith in the power of the working class was severely diminished. Yet things did not start well, and they proceeded to go downhill. I mentioned earlier Zhang Guotao, his main opponent. He raised three sets of questions. Uh, first, did the Nationalist Party represent the national movement? Second, was there a possibility of reorganizing the Guomindang? And third, could the revolutionary moment, movement only be developed through this form uh, of cooperation? For Zhang, it was clear that the CCP's interests would be submerged if all members joined the Guomindang. Yes, they had to work closely, but we should work outside of this. And he found strong support amongst his colleagues. He wanted to develop the Communist Party where there was no strength in the nationalist movement. By contrast, Snaefleet uh, defended his, uh, his approach. I won't go back into it because I've outlined it before. And he called for a vote on a set of theses which had been drawn up by Chen Duxiu. And those theses encapsulated his approach to promoting the revolution in China. The vote was really close. It went through 21 to 16. So it showed that he won the battle, but he hadn't necessarily won the war at this particular time. And in fact, opposition continued. And in the following months, there was little uh, forward momentum. When the Congress finished, the party moved its headquarters away from Canton, where the nationalist movement was, and back to Shanghai, absolutely baffling Snaefleet, who lamented that, I cannot understand why the party prefers Shanghai's illegality over Guangzhou's legality. So in October 1923, Hank Snaefleet left China, expecting to to return to Moscow to review his work and get his new assignment. But many key figures in the Chinese Communist Party were actually happy uh, to see him leave. Within the Comintern, Snaefleet's perceived pro Sun Yat sen position was unpopular with key figures such as Radek, Safarov, and also Wojtynski, while his criticism that they were dreaming of an imminent creation of a mass communist party did not go down well with them. Also, of course, his later disillusionment with Sun Yat-sen as he began to work more closely with him and his suggestions that the Russians were wasting their money supporting him must have baffled those in Moscow, given how strongly he'd argued on his behalf. So it was never likely that that assignment would be extended. They did offer him the job to go back as a journalist working for Rosta, but he declined. Now on his way back to Moscow from Shanghai, Snaefly ran into his, his replacement, Mikhail Borodin. And Borodin was on his way to Guangzhou to implement Snaefly's approach to reorganize the Guomindang, manage cooperation between Sun Yat-sen, the Chinese Communist Party and Soviet Russia. It must have been an excruciating encounter. We don't have any direct record of it, but one can only imagine that it must have been excruciating for Hank Snaefleet, because it made it patently obvious that Snaefleet's China, time in China had come to an end. The chance meeting, in my view, was a clear symbolic moment in the changing nature of Russian engagement in the Chinese Revolution. The moment marked the passing of the baton from the internationalist vision 
of a global proletarian revolution to one more closely aligned with Russian national interests. What more obvious sign could there be than the exit of the Dutch globetrotting revolutionary and the entrance of a Russian member of the Bolshevik party? So despite his interest, he was never to return to China, but his work has left an enduring legacy with that tactic of the United Front, which the Chinese Communist Party has used on multiple occasions, the war against the Japanese in the 1950s, when it wanted to restore its economy, and also in the reform period, trying to build alliances with those it saw as necessary to help it meet its goals. <laughs> 